Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hazima Mozam and I welcome you all to Comstech. And uh, for the on behalf of Comstech and myself, I would also like to thank our guest speakers who have joined us from uh, Turkey and Indonesia for accepting our invitation and traveling all the way from their respective countries. Um, in addition to that, I would also like to thank our esteem, esteemed um, guests and speakers from the embassy of Turkey. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I'm also like to, I would also like to thank our virtual participants who are joining us from uh, different uh, time zones uh, of the world. And with this, um, the title of the lecture today is Recent Research and Development in Zoonotic Diseases and DNA Vaccines, Bridging Health and Innovation. We will formally begin uh, the session um, with the recitation from Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء Now, I would like to invite our honorable uh, guest, our uh, distinguished guest from uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Honorable Abdul Noor Sikindi, Director General of Science and Technology, for his um, remarks, sir. Over to you. Uh, <clears throat> Your Excellency, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Chodhari, Coordinator General of Comstech. Uh, Honorable Mr. Rahmat Hindiarat, Church the Affairs Embassy of Indonesia. Honorable Mr. Mohamed Toiran, Education Counselor, Embassy of Turkey. Uh, representatives of OIC member states present. Members of the, the diplomatic corps, distinguished scientists and experts. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, it is with great pleasure and a sense of duty that I extend a warm welcome to each of you to this important public lecture entitled Recent Research and Development in Zoonotic Diseases and DNA Vaccines, Breaching Bridging Health and Innovation, jointly organized by Comstech. Uh, this is one of the most pressing issues facing not only OIC member states, but also the developing countries at large. I wish to express our thanks and gratitude 
to the Comstech Coordination Office and the esteemed scientists from the OIS member states who have organized this significant event. Special acknowledgement is due to Dr. Deria Karata, CN of Najmeddin Erbakan University, Turkey, and Professor Dr. Badiman, Badiman Bella of Universitas Indonesia from the Republic of Indonesia for their presence here today. I also extend appreciation to the speakers from the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Republic of Indonesia who will be sharing their insights on this subject virtually. Uh, the objective of this gathering is to foster greater engagement from higher education and research, research institutions of IC member states in health research, particularly in vaccine production. Vaccine production holds immense significance in the Muslim world for a number of reasons, some of which I wish to emphasize. One, disease prevention and public health. Vaccines are one of the most critical and affordable methods of preventing the spread of infectious diseases, especially in densely populated regions prevalent in the Muslim world. Two, pandemic preparedness. A robust vaccine production capacity is indispensable for effective pandemic response and safeguarding populations from emerging infectious threats. Three, self-reliance and independence. Local vaccine production ensures auto autonomy in healthcare, mitigating vulnerabilities associated with dependence on imported vaccines. Mm -hmm. One of the most, the hardest lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic is the urgent need to further diversify global vaccine manufacturing particularly with regards to OIC member states. With the political realities of nationalism, trade barriers, and the absence of regional manufacturing capability and capacity, rapid and equitable global access to, to life-saving vaccines can be compromised, compromised, leading to delays that put lives at risk. The fourth important uh, point here is economic growth and innovation. Investment in vaccine production catalyzes economic development, stimulates innovation, and cultivates a skilled workforce. Five, global health equity. Contributing to vaccine production addresses global health disparities, aligning with Islamic principles of compassion and equity. Six, diplomacy and international cooperation. A strong vaccine production capacity enhances a nation's diplomatic standing and fosters collaboration on global health and initiative. Seven, education and awareness. Vaccine production initiatives can be accompanied by educational campaigns, promoting a culture of preventive health care and bolstering, bolstering community health. Due to these reasons, OIC and its relevant institutions, such as the Islamic Development Banker Group, have always encouraged efforts aimed at achieving self-reliance in the production and supply of quality, effective, and affordable vaccines. It is therefore imperative to double our efforts to achieve self-reliance in production of and supply of vaccines. These efforts that started some six or seven years ago by the establishment of the OIC Vaccine Manufacturers Group need to be intensified and supported so that in future, the health of our people is not left at the mercy of multinational companies whose primary objective is making profits. In conclusion, the imperative of vaccine production in the Muslim world cannot be overstated. It serves as a cornerstone for addressing public health challenges, nurturing economic growth, and advancing global health equity, all while upholding Islamic values. We are hopeful that this gathering, this gathering will serve as a catalyst for enhancing research and industrial capacities among member states, facilitated by the invaluable contribu contributions of the eminent scholars uh, participating in this public lecture. 
On the behalf of the OIC General Secretariat, I wish to extend our sincerest gratitude and well wishes, and I'm optimistic that this event will herald a new era of scientific diplomacy within the OIC community through the auspices of Homestake. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your valuable time and kind words. Um, with us, uh, we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, we have our Honorable Guest of Honor from the Embassy of Indonesia, Charge to Affair, Honorable Mr. Rahmat Hindiyarta. Sir, over to you for your remarks, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Theodri, Distinguished National Professor, Coordinator General of Comstack. Honorable Abdunur Sekindi, Director General of Science and Technology, OIC General Secretariat, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. His Excellency, uh, Dr. Mehmet Masasi, in this occasion, His Excellency is represented by uh, Mr. Mehmet Tayran, Education Counselor of uh, Turkey, at uh, the Embassy of Turkey in uh, Islamabad. Honorable speakers, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I extend my sincere gratitude to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Standing Committee on Scientific on scientific and technological cooperation or comstack for having me in this important occasion. And the scientists, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already said in the Quran in Surah Al Mujadilah verse eleven, Yerfailahu Ladina Amnu Minkum, Well Ladina Utula al Matarajat, Wallah Bima Takmaluna Khabir. Allah will elevate in ranks those who believed among you and those who have been given knowledge. Allah is aware of what you do. My presence here is also expected to be well infected by that kind of rank elevation. Ladies and gentlemen, the claim that Muslim scientists played a vital role in laying down the foundations of modern science and technology cannot be contested. Indeed, Muslims benefited from the scientists, sorry, uh, benefited from the sciences of various civilizations, such as Chinese, Indian, Roman, Persian, and Greek. However, Muslims then added their own original and significant findings, refreshing several branches of knowledge, including physics, medicine, chemistry, and optics, and subsequently passed it on to the Western world. Some experts also said that the mastery of science and technology is among critical aspects of the rise and fall of civilizations. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia underscores the importance of science and technology. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed the strategic aspect of the health sectors to be continuously developed to its highest level. For sure, it enormously needs innovation in all health sectors from upstream to downstream. Back in 2017, Indonesia began to establish itself as a, as a base for vaccine manufacturing. At that time, leveraging the fact that it has the world's largest Muslim population to become a hub for halal vaccine production. The state-run company of Biopharma in Bandung has already been the biggest vaccine manufacturer in Southeast Asia and a major exporter. The company has had wide collaboration and cooperation in vaccine production with the multiple global companies such as those in the United States and China on a range of vaccine production projects. Moreover, the government of the Republic of Indonesia is currently implementing a blueprint for digital health 
Transformation Strategy 2024 as a comprehensive set of measures to utilize digital technology to enhance accessibility, data integration, administrative procedures, planning, delivery, and much more across the healthcare sector. Along with rapid growth in government healthcare spending, the private pharm pharmaceutical sector is also set to continue expanding robustly in the years ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my remarks by extending an offer to the health sectors in Pakistan and the OIC member states for more collaboration and cooperation in pharma and health sectors in Indonesia, including the field of research and technology supporting the sectors. For that point, the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia in Islamabad is your right partner. I fervently believe that the next years of growing ties will be even more glorious. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Inshallah, see you uh, in the, the other occasions. Wallahumma fiq lakmantarik, wala'afa minkum, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Excellency, um, for your kind words um, and a very uh, comprehensive remarks. Uh, with this, I would uh, request our next speaker, guest of honor, um, Honorable Mr. Mehmet Toren, um, who is the education counselor at the Embassy of Turkey in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, honorable dignitaries, uh, esteemed guests, and distinguished colleagues. The collaboration between the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and Comstech Islamabad has been instrumental in advancing research and development in the fields of the zoonotic uh, diseases and DNA vaccines. Through this partnership, member states, including Turkey, have been able to pool resources, share expertise, and coordinate efforts to tackle pressing health challenges. By fostering collaboration and knowledge exchange among member states, OIC and Comstech have facilitated ground groundbreaking research initiatives that have led to significant advancements in understanding, preventing, and treating zoonotic diseases. Additionally, joint efforts have accelerated the development and deployment of DNA vaccines, offering promising solutions to combat infectious diseases more effectively. As the Education Councilor of Turk Turkey Embassy, I commend the collaborative spirit of OIC and Comstech, which has enabled Turkey and other member states to collectively contribute to global air security. Together, we continue to drive innovation, strength, scientific cooperation, and improve the well-being of communities worldwide. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, with this, I would request our uh, esteemed uh, senior director, HR and administration, to present souvenirs to our guests from the embassy. First, I would request Mr. Rahmat, uh, charge the affair, Embassy of Indonesia, to so, kindly receive your souvenir from Comstech side. Now, I would request our guest of honor from uh, Education Council, Embassy of Turkey, Honorable Mr. Mehmet, to receive his souvenir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, 
With this, uh, we will begin our technical session for the day uh, with the first talk is from uh, Professor Dr. Didia Yani. Uh, Professor Dr. Yani is from Department of Microbiology at Metin uh, Arbakan University, Turkey. The title of her talk is Important Zoonotic Diseases That Threaten uh, Human Health. Uh, Dr. Yani, I welcome you for your talk. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank Comstack for your hospitality and also my respects to the brotherly people of Pakistan. Salam from Turkey. I am Dr. Darya Karatakshini. I'm working in Nejat Nabakan University. I'm head of microbiology department. Also, I work as vice dean in this university. Actually, I'm a bacteriologist and veterinarian. Today, I will talk about zoonotic diseases and vaccines, also in Turkey. Does it work? No? Yeah, thank you. We are facing a global problem, the rise of zoonotic diseases. The diseases like plaque, Ebola, COVID-19, and uh, another zoonotic diseases have caused a lot of trouble, claiming lives and disrupting economies. Despite our advanced in science and technology, we are still vulnerable to these diseases. Basically, what is the zoonotic disease? Diseases that can be transmitted from animal to human are defined as zoonotic diseases. Why zoonotic diseases important? Why are zoonotic diseases important? Zoonotic diseases threaten all people, regardless of gender, socioeconomic situation, and uh, age, lifestyle, and they cause suffering and death. They impose heavy financial burdens on society. Every year, 2.5 million cases of of zoonosis occur worldwide in each year, yeah? And sadly, 2.7 million people die from zoonotic diseases. And 60%, 60% uh, 60 almost of zoonotic diseases seen in humans are of animal origin. Five new human diseases emerge every year. Three of them are zoonotic. And 90% uh, of foodborne diseases in humans result from consuming animal products. And sadly, it's very important, 80% of potential bioterrorist agents have zoonotic origin. And uh, also, these pathogens threat to public health and national security. There are many reasons responsible from zoonotic diseases. First, the global population. World population has expanded. The growth population is accompanied by uncontrolled 
urbanization and the climate changing and rising temperatures increase the reproduction rate of this pathogen, vectors, arthropods, and uh, uh, blood feeding insects. And uh, uh, we destroy natural habitats and come closer wildlife day by day. And the global transportation and trade led to rapid spread of pathogens. This book uh, written by me and respectable Pakistani scientists. It's a very good example for this issue. The chapter examines the effects of zoonotic diseases, climate change on zoonotic diseases, which is rising concern in the scientist world. I will talk about, I will short to talk about most of transmission of zoonotic diseases. It's very important issue for you. First, the direct contact. Direct contact means physical contact as the, uh, with the infected animals, physical contact with infected animals. For example, saliva, urine, and the blood, yeah, feces with the mucosal membranes, and the true bites and some scratches and active penetration. And the indirect contact, contact with contaminated, uh, infected animals, areas, contact with contaminated objects and surfaces. And the vector-borne transmission, the transmission of uh, when a human bitten by a pig and insects, mosquitoes, uh, some pathogens can be transmitted to the human. This is the vector-borne transmission. Uh, this picture from Turkey, uh, it's me and, yeah, this is the water well, this place in a village, way of transmission by drinking contaminated water, it is a good example, a local tularemia epidemic broke out in this village, it's highly possible that infected rodents contaminated the water. This is the water well. People in the village were infected with tularemia from the common water source. Another transmission, foodborne transmission, related to uh, contaminated food items such as raw milk, and unpasteurized milk, uncooked meat, and the contaminated raw fruits and vegetables. Uh, also, short to talk about additional transmission routes. Uh, first, the soil contamination, uh, contaminated with animal manure. And uh, as you know, patients to healthcare worker transmission uh, maybe ha uh, happen from infected patients to healthcare worker. How are zoonoses classified? According to, firstly, we classified according to reservoirs. For example, uh, zoonoses transmitted from white animals to humans, as you know, COVID-19 and the rabies, for example. And the uh, uh, zoonoses transmitted semi-wild animals, for example, pigeons and the rats, rodents, yeah? Uh, also, people contract chlamydia pisitasi from pigeon, and the people contract uh, leptospirosis from uh, rat urine. And the uh, uh, donors are transmitted from domestic animals to humans, for example, cat scratch diseases, as the Bartonella hanselea and the brucellosis and Q fever. Ucellus is transmitted to humans uh, through cattle, sheep, and goat. Uh, vested uh, abortions uh, and the unpasteurized milk. Another 
uh, classification according to disease agents. Uh, first, the bacterial zoonosis, you know, leptospirosis, brucellosis, and uh, salmonellosis, and the glander. Uh, second, the viral zoonosis, for example, the rabies, COVID-19, West Nile virus. And mycotic zoonosis, that's important, aspergillosis, very important. And the parasitic zoonosis, as no uh, toxoplasmosis, hidaticus, toxoplasmosis uh, can transmit it from uh, raw milk. And the pre induced zoonosis, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. According to source of diseases, um, foodborne zoonosis. I just mentioned uh, salmonellosis and campylobacter can be transmitted to humans through poultry meat. And the uh, uh, contact origin zoonosis, Bulkoldoria mali, uh, these three diseases, a high risk infection, Bulkoldoria mali, anthrax, and francella tularensis. Uh, these are very deadly and notifiable diseases in our country and in the world. And the tick-borne zoonosis, as you know, Lyme diseases uh, from Borrelia burgdorferi, and the uh, zoonosis originated from migratory birds, avian influenza, for example avian influenza, and waterborne zoonosis, I just mentioned uh, in our slide, E. coli and salmonellosis and leptospirosis. I have written examples of zoonotic diseases in the slide, some viral zoonosis, bacterial zoonosis, and parasitic zoonosis. Some of them are high-risk infections, such as tularemia, and tracts, Q fever, plaque, tuberculosis, and rabies, COVID-19, hunter virus, and malaria. And this slide, the most important global diseases in the world. I will say, firstly, uh, name of virus, and the country of origin. First, the Marburg virus from Uganda, Ebola from DRC, Democratic Republic Congo, Nipah virus from Malaysia, and the SARS virus, country of origin, China, and the uh, H5N1. Bird flu from China, also from China. And the MERS control of Saudi Arabia. And the H7 and 9 bird flu from China. And the H1 and 1 swine flu, US and Mexico. And the seasonal flu, uh, as you know, infected 1 billion people. And the last the COVID 19 and ongoing from China. Here you see the location of Turkey. Turkey has uh, 85 million population and 81 provinces. Turkey extends between Europe, Middle East, and Caucasus. And the Turkey has 30 sub ecoregions under eight ecoregions. The climate is the world across to Turkey due to Turkey's location. It's exposed to zoonotic infections, the movement of animals, particularly bird migrations. The geographical structure also provides suitable habitats for various vectors, arthropods, mosquitoes, such as blood feeding insects the years. And uh, it's important, irregular movement of people and animals negatively impact the efforts to combat these diseases. But uh, what are we doing? 
many years, Turkey has collaborated with FAO, WHO, and WHO. For what? For detecting, controlling, and eliminating risks of zoonotic diseases. When a zoonotic diseases broke out in Turkey, we report these diseases to these institutions, Food and Agriculture Organizational, United Nations, WHO, and FAO. In May 1978, the Zoonosis Control Program was established Mediterranean countries, including Turkey. In 1991, Turkey Zoonosis National Committee was formed through the collaboration between Minister of Health and formerly named Minister of Food and Agriculture and Livestock. And the last action plan has been prepared in Turkey aiming to eradicate zoonosis, zoonotic diseases in our country, and the plans continue actively. What's the mission of the committee? First, to operate with end one health concept. Identify zoonotic diseases in Turkey, conduct research, improve training to understand the spread and impact of zoonotic diseases, and foster partnership between national and national institutions. I want to say this our directive, our legislation for combating diseases in Turkey has compatible with European Union. If a disease occurs in a region, the government veterinarian takes a sample from the animal and uh, sends it to the laboratory. Quarantina starts before the results come from the lab because we, the worst scenario is considered. If the result is positive, Ministry of Food and Agriculture and Livestock informs the Ministry of Health. For what? For people. Human-related precautions are also taken. What should we do for protection? Firstly, creating a good reporting disease system and uh, creating preventive vaccine programs. Good management of infected animals. Uh, for example, distinguish between healthy and unhealthy animals and in, impose quarantine measures. Uh, it's very important to inform farmers, healthcare professionals, and the general public about zoonotic diseases and risks. Because during an epidemic, the public is in panic. When the, uh, do you remember when the uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy epidemic broke out? No one ate red meat. When the uh, bird flu epidemic broke out, no one ate poultry meat because the public is in panic. Uh, we have to inform about zoonotic diseases, how to prevent, how to spread. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> developing early warning systems. All sectors work together to develop different strategies. And uh, combat diseases, the concept of one health system have been developed. And in this concept, human, animal, and environmental health is considered as one. For this purpose, coordination should be made. I just mentioned organizations such as WHO, WHO, and FAO. We have to cooperate with also neighboring countries. 
In March 2022, FAO, WHO, and formerly OIE, WA, and UNEP signed this document, signed an agreement, the One Health Joint Action Plan. Outlined in the document established cooperation to combat human, animal, and environmental health risks. Did you know one health issues? First, the antimicrobial resistance. It's a very important issue, maybe another working issue, workshop issue, training issue. Yeah. Uh, I will short to talk about antibiotic resistance. Uh, and as uh, germs can secrete between people, animal, and environment, antibiotic resistance is one of the top global problems and threatens humans and animals. And another issue, environmental health, I just mentioned, the damage and the food safety, vector borne diseases, you know, and the zoonotic diseases. With one health approach concept, we can prevent outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, improve food safety, safety and security, and reduce antimicrobial resistance, infections, and improve human and animal health. I will shortly about <clears throat> you're short to talk about vaccines. One of the most essential strategies for controlling the diseases is the rapid development of safe and effective vaccines. Vaccines in Turkey, uh, the stamps show smallpox vaccination in Turkey in the history and the uh, Ottoman Empire. Vaccine production, uh, for production studies in our country started during the Ottoman Empire. The first law in the world regarding smallpox vaccination was enacted in the Ottoman Empire in the 1885. As you see in this section, you see some viral and bacterial vaccines produced in Turkey, but I didn't write all of them. Uh, for example, these bacterial vaccines, first the Rhodococcus aequi, and the, some, we produce some Clostridial vaccine, uh, Clostridium shovi, Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium botulinum, yeah, and the E. coli, and the Pastorella, Multocida, and Manhamia hemolytica vaccines and the anthrax vaccine, brucellosis vaccine, mycoplasma, borexella bovis for the keratoconjunctivit, and uh, for paratuberculosis vaccine, and the coronabacterium pseudotuberculosis vaccine. And we also have combined vaccine. We also produce combined vaccine, E. coli rotavirus and coronavirus and E. coli and ORT vaccines. And the leptospirosis, Borrelia, Burgdorferi, and the mastitis vaccines. We also viral produce both viral vaccines. And for example, PPR, as you know, eczema, and the bovine ephemeral fever, you know, FMD, foot and mouth diseases, yeah, and the lumpy skin diseases, coronavirus, also for animal and human, for people, gluten virus vaccine, yes, rotavirus, and some mycotic and protozoan vaccine. We also produced for tyleria and trichophyton vaccine. Here is a team headed by Professor Aykut Özdayrandali that developed Turkovac vaccine, the Turkish vaccine against COVID-19. Congratulations. During the pandemic, 
both inactive coronavac and mRNA vaccine were used primary vaccination. And then we produced our own vaccine. Turkovac vaccine, I will shortly uh, talk about, and whole cell inactivated vaccine containing adjuvant aluminum hydroxide. Yeah, the suspension contains inactive antigen uh, obtained from SARS-CoV-2. This is the this picture and uh, from Turkey, this factory uh, GMP premises, yeah? Control of every stage and the production of a vaccine is important. This is the good manufacturing practice, GMP, is required to obtain quality and safety. There are several GMP premises, factories in Turkey for vaccine production. Turkey is such sufficient, I want to say, in the production of important animal vaccines and the resilience of our veterinary vaccine pro, uh, manufacturing system has enabled the development of human vaccines for the COVID-19 pandemic. It's very important. For example, in 2023, we produced a totally 50, eight million doses of FMD vaccines. We will fight animal diseases effectively by increased domestic vaccine production. For possible new pandemics, the National Prevention and Treatment Platform, CORTUP, in Turkey, support five more type of vaccine projects. For example, Lanchmania, Helicobacter pylori, Klebsiella, Hantavirus, and H9 and 2 influenza, and uh, projects in cooperation with 20 universities and two private sectors. Turkey is uh, trying to, to threaten its current situation for these diseases. And for this purpose, Turkey is working on preparation for pandemics and uh, early diagnosis and laboratory capacities. And the effective and new vaccine research are actively continuing in our country under the leadership of various organizations. Results, the new age of zoonosis of pandemic has begun and continues. The local zoonotic diseases are rapidly becoming global. Human, animal, and environmental health insect at many points. For this reason, administrative and political decisions should target a healthy world. Yeah, fight against zoonotic diseases should be assessed with a general perspective, with a one health approach, and future pandemic perspective. My last sentence, in order for people to be healthy in a society, animals must first be healthy. It is important for generations. I'm, I work on zoonotic diseases, high risk zoonotic diseases, this is me when I was young. <laughs> and uh, I work on high risk zoonosis on the biosafety level three and four laboratory, yeah? Thank you so much. Teşekkür ederim. It means 30 sentences, thank you so much. Thank you, I am very happy to be here.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Yani, for a very wonderful uh, talk. With this, I open uh, the floor for the question and answers uh, for our esteemed speaker, uh, sir. Uh, my question is, is there any vaccine that is a pre-qualified in your case? Uh, any vaccine? Any vaccine that is pre-qualified by WHO in this case? Yes. How many? Uh, for animals, for people? For animals or for humans? For any vaccine. Oh. WHO is pre-qualified. All established from ERP factory, all vaccines are qualified. Yeah, we have to satisfy. I agree with you. Yeah. You have national regulatory authority that is then be approved by your national Turkia regulatory authority. Yes. Is there any vaccine which is pre qualified by the future or not? Mm. Uh, FMD and the uh, rabies and the I um, okay. Doesn't work also. You know Turkovac? And uh, uh, first the Turkovac and the PPR, FMD vaccine, yeah? And the blue tongue virus vaccine. This combined vaccine, E. coli, rotocorona. And the uh, anthrax. Uh, Maxitern, Fox One, and Fox Two vaccine, and the brucellosis vaccine, and the Rhodococcus. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, sir, kindly introduce yourself as well. Sir. <laughs> I am Mohammad Tariq uh, working in the Technical Medical Medicine. Uh, I have just one uh, question, although it is very much uh, comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, one thing uh, that is on the vaccine that you mentioned in the field of top five, so there is no real medication in Turkey. Is there any vaccine that is based on a real uh, platform? Uh, no. There is no way that I mean, sir. There are people at the time of the vaccine. No, for DNA vaccine, no real vaccine. And what about? They are uh, studying on DNA vaccine. Uh, and MR and A vaccine and vaccinal and adenoviral vaccine. They all uh, vaccine studied on Turkey, but. Uh, we complete only adenoviral and feral vaccine and inactive vaccine, part one and part two. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, what may be uh, the general perception about uh, about understanding of our genotic disease in life performance in Turkey? Mm -hmm. Can you please repeat your question? Uh, what, is the, uh, what are the uh, understanding about the genotic diseases in general lifestyle population, a lifestyle population in Turkey. To see the key, the children, genotic diseases, the new genes, the new children, the new children, the new children, the new children, the new we established a system, treat system, treat system, name of system. We informed all farmers and the general public. We arranged um, training. Yeah, uh, it's a good uh, system. Yeah, name of treat uh, We 
If you want, you, you sort it on internet, two best system. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Yani, we have two questions from our virtual uh, speaker. One is from uh, Ms. Anila. She's asking, can you please request our speaker to elaborate a bit on antimicrobial resistance in context of zoonotic diseases? Uh, with context to the zoonotic diseases. Can you please elaborate, in, elaborate on it? Like, can you connect? how these two things are related to each other or if they're not related? Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, uh, this uh, the person is asking, what kind of vaccine SARS vaccine was produced in Turkey? Was it an inactivated uh, crude or a vector vaccine? What kind of vaccine was SARS? Inactivated vaccine. Inactivated vaccine. Right. Uh, do we have another question from the in person uh, audience? Kindly introduce yourself. My name is yeah. The question is, where do we see the world after we are to leave the media vaccination, for such a vaccination? Where do we see the world? Dunia ne re re go diyoruz. Dunia ne şey, vaccine ve de tamam dedikten sonra dunia ne re re I don't know. I am not sure. And very the question is very important. Near zoonotic age and maybe vegan, but uh, I don't know. New pandemics broke out and uh, Another vaccine. We have to develop, develop some vaccine. Yeah. Uh, do we have another question here uh, from the audience? Uh, do we have another question? So I have a question, Dr. Yani. Um, you, uh, in your slides, you have mentioned there are combined vaccines, like you mentioned Rota plus E. coli and SARS vaccine. Yeah. So what is the significance of that? Why do you want to have a combined vaccine with Rota, of SARS with Rota and E. coli? So uh, in some regions in Turkey, uh, this uh, diseases are combined, yeah? Uh, okay. We have to develop the combined vaccine, yeah, in Turkey. Uh, only in Turkey, yeah. right, right. So there is another question. Uh, there is another question from the online participant. Uh, he's asking, Dr. Yani, uh, how can one health approach contribute to preventing and uh, managing? I, I don't hear. Yeah. Uh, kindly, uh, sir, please uh, focus on the talk. Sir. Um, so there is another question. How can uh, one health approach contribute to preventing and managing zoonotic diseases? Considering the interconnectedness of human, animal, and environmental health. Yeah. So, can you? Uh, uh, yeah. We, uh, yeah, 
Yes, and I'll just put it. We stop. Okay. Um, and uh, another in the flag, in the previous flag, and then when we this is the question. There is a document in 2022 signed an agreement uh, with FAO, WHO, and WAR, and the UNEP uh, for the environmental mm. health. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, from Pakistan or from Pakistan. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe in Pakistan, how to establish this one health system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of uh, I don't know Agriculture. And yeah, yeah, and yeah, and agriculture and livestock. And agriculture and livestock, and uh, like UNEP Ministry of. Environment environmental mm. uh, have to uh, improve some uh, one half approach. Yeah, mm. I just mentioned mm. right on the issue. Right. So there is another question. Uh, is there any mutation in the DNA structure during zoonosis? Yes. Yes. Uh, are no, there no, no. all that? But I'm about to just uh, actually and um, viral zoonosis is mostly mutation. Okay, in viral zoonosis. Yeah. Okay, All right. So do we have another question here from the audience? Can you introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm from Pajarin. I'm a scholar. I have a question that uh, you have mentioned that early diagnosis is one of the steps that can be used, uh, that can contribute to the world health action plan. Is there any specific strategy uh, which is related with the earlier diagnosis of those infection that you have mentioned that you have discovered uh, or uh, that you, uh, you are aware of? Any question? Yes, uh, I'm Sarah Sharma. I'm from Early warning system? Yes, there is only Lina Sumi. Uh, also, two questions that also combined with the uh, information system and the uh, early warning system. Yeah, they established the system and this is the combined system. Maybe in Pakistan, is there any uh, early warning system or information system? No? Yes, there are. Actually, there are. Uh, I have also read my PhD from Turkey, so I know a little bit about this question. Uh, there, there is a project going on right now in Turkey where they have sensors. Uh, there is a, you know, you know those uh, acids or the, the scent that is uh, that is. Uh, from different uric acids and all those, but they sent. They have sensors in the farms, so they sent before if the uh, disease is coming or not. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, they can uh, have a uh, you know a system where they can uh, feel that the disease is coming or not. Uh, so Turkey is working on that in collaboration with the European countries, uh, and they're. So it's going on to be pretty much active. Thank you. Uh, so is there any other question here? Can you introduce yourself? My name is Mr. Krishna. I'm a three medical student. My question is that uh, you said that zoonotic diseases are the uh, when that are transmitted from animals to humans. So my question is that we should also take care from our pets that are in our homes. Yes, especially, but uh, your uh, dog and cat, um, cat, which one? Which pet? The pet in our home, like cat, cat, cat. Okay. Um, especially from cat, cat dragon diseases. You have to vaccine, uh, you have to uh, vaccination program, Bartonella, and uh, for dog, 
graphene and another pyroviral, yeah, diseases. And uh, also uh, from cattle, from cellulosis and the goat and the sheep, cucumber, complebacter, all diseases maybe we can transmit to humans. For this reason, they have vaccines, you know, you just yeah. have to vaccinate your pets and then you're safe. Uh, so just following up on his question, I have a question. So in Turkey, for example, if there is somebody who has a cattle farm, so there is somebody who is a farmer who has a cattle farm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is there any system that the government maintains in order to know that if those animals are vaccinated for certain you know, uh, diseases which are common in the country or in that particular area? Yeah. Uh, the brucellosis is 19 vaccine for cattle, and the brucellosis many times is grade one vaccine uh, for sheep and goat. And uh, there is a system vaccination system uh, for the domestic animals for okay. brucellosis. And then a brucellosis broke out uh, in the Turkey. Uh, we uh, collect some samples from the animals, blood serum, right. and we uh, examine uh, for serology tests. Mm. For example, rose bangle plate test and serum agglutination test and the complement fixation test. Yeah, uh, if it is positive, positive, uh, we have to quarantine measures. We have to apply quarantine measures. And uh, we have to apply vaccination. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Is there any other question uh, from the audience? So I would uh, request uh, two individuals uh, from our in-person audience to uh, to say a few words about Dr. Yanni's presentation. So you have to volunteer. Two people. One from this side and one from this side. Who will volunteer? Just say a few words about Dr. Yanni's presentation and what you have learned in this presentation so far. Sir, you in the, yeah, in the second last. Yeah, with the brown jacket. Can you please say a few words about Dr. Yanni's presentation? Uh, we will take it from her as well. Kindly you introduce yourself. So the presentation is quite good that every set of things I've read is very well. So as a teaching point of view, she teaches very well in the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so um, and you're you're doing what degree and at I'm studying here at yes, Allied Health. Allied Health Sciences. He's studying Allied Health Sciences from National University of Medical Sciences in Islamabad. Uh, do we have another uh, one from this side? Okay, so Madam, you. I'm Dr. Dikshan from Kajali University. I'm doing entering biotechnology. Bushra. Bushra, yeah. You also have Bushra in Turkey. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was very informative and very insightful session. It was great presentation. And partly it was uh, very insightful for me because uh, uh, currently I, am, I have started my research and I'm searching for my topic. Okay. And, um, I, I am working molecular pathology lab, so it's uh, uh, your presentation um, like uh, give me ideas and mm. uh, provide me opportunity to brainstorm that there are uh, in, in which domain I can further work. Okay. Thank you so much. So great. Thank you. Do we have another one from this side? There are a lot of things, new things that you have learned. I'm sure. So you, yes. The one with the brown, with the abaya, black abaya, you introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm Mahmoud Shah from Concept University Campus. Uh, I learned um, that how Turkey is working on vaccines. Uh, because I, uh, I don't know if there were a lot of vaccines they are already producing. Yes. Today. They are producing the combined vaccines. Exactly. I yes. Uh, okay, so Dr. Yani, just last question. Uh, just last two questions here. Um, what is the relationship between COVID nineteen and I don't know if that's quite and cholesterol increase in humans? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so there is another. Yeah. yeah, okay, so. No, as a, uh, yes, I will reply. Yes. Uh, I think. Yeah, um, uh, maybe Dr. Sana, uh, a viral disease, and I'm not a good chance of blood value. Yes. 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 Yeah. Right. Uh, so. Might be because of that drug, not directly related to the disease, but because of the medical battery. I think it was symptoms say. What? Because of the case of just cholesterol. Then cholesterol level increase, heart problems increase, with cholesterol. Uh, asthma uh, and heart problems, problem. not only because I stole. Yeah. So there's yeah, no. Then, uh, yeah, it's some of the problems with unhealthy. Yes. 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 So there is no direct relationship between COVID nineteen and cholesterol increase. Um. So just. I'm not. Yeah. 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 Maybe. So just the last question. Uh, how can we succeed in vaccinology? What special reference to zoonotic diseases? Okay, this question. Uh, how can we succeed in vaccinology? He means vaccination with special reference to zoonotic diseases. So basically, he is. Maybe we can collaborate another here country. Yes, yes. Program you attend. And the program, I don't know, uh, we, uh, maybe you have to improve your scientific qualification. Right. Also, we collaborate with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So there, there's just another qu uh, comment that I would like to read out for you. Um, he is Professor Dr. Talai. He is uh, Ghulam Raza Talai. He is joining us from Iran. He is saying that I would recommend to, elab to uh, elaborate on Iran vaccine. I, uh, sir, we will have a speaker from Iran, and he will be speaking about uh, vaccine production in Iran. Uh, but what I get from his, um, uh, from his comment here is that he says that no mRNA vaccine was used in Iran. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please a uh, round of applause for our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, okay, now moving on to the next talk of uh, the technical session. Um, we have Professor Dr. Budiman Bella. Professor Dr. Bella is a professor at, uh, associated with Faculty of Medicine, Universities, Indonesia. The title of his talk today is DNA Vaccine, What We Have Achieved and Existing Challenges. Uh, participants, I would like you to please uh, keep quiet and focus on the talk. Write down your questions so that we can have questions in the end. So, uh, Dr. Bella, please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank Comstack for uh, 
giving me the opportunity to speak in this uh, really uh, great occasion. Now, the talk given to me is about DNA vaccine, what we have achieved and existing challenges. That, well, that is what I proposed. But uh, I didn't realize by that time that uh, the uh, audience actually consisted of various people coming from probably different, uh, very diverse uh, background, faculty background. But I believe, uh, I hope that uh, it will be uh, easily understood because at the same time, I have to present about molecular biology. You have some of you seems to be in, in the field of molecular biology, but also uh, the challenge is to try to uh, explain about immunology, which I believe many of you understand it is not easy to uh, deliver or uh, to present as well. Uh, but without further ado, I will try to do my best to make it as uh, understandable as possible. Now, uh, the agenda of my presentation is about vaccination and the impact on human race, vaccine platforms, the ideal vaccine for a pandemic situation, advantages of DNA vaccine, history of DNA vaccine, mode of action of DNA vaccine, main components of DNA vaccine, and uh, a little bit about, about DNA vaccine production, efficacy and safety, prospects of DNA vaccine, and uh, some conclusions and recommendations. Now, we know that vaccination has a big impact on human race, and we can see here that actually since uh, ancient times, some um, marks of uh, infectious diseases, evidence of infectious diseases has been found. This is from uh, Paro Ramses' uh, five mummy. And also uh, pictures that you can see uh, on the pyramids actually show that polio has already occurred uh, in those times. Uh, however, we have success stories regarding vaccination, and this is uh, what was found in China. It, they tried to exercise what they called as variolation, and uh, what is being done is that um, there is a procedure known as insertion, where smallpox caps were dried, and then it is grounded and blown into nostrils using a pipe. And what happened? The uh, people who are subjected to this variolation, they actually become immune to smallpox. But of course, there, there is a risk as well. Some people died as well due to this procedure. Now, um, global program, program has made a difference in the eradication of smallpox. And this is something that of course, we hope can happen to other diseases, but uh, of course, like different uh, microorganisms behave differently. The vaccine that can be used for eradication also, uh, of course, can be different. Also here, we, we know that smallpox is actually a DNA virus. They don't change easily as uh, RNA virus, viruses, uh, COVID-19, for example, that we know keep on mutating as we develop the vaccine, then you got new strains uh, coming out. Now, with COVID-19 pandemic, of course, we do have success stories as well regarding the use of vaccine, even though it is still circulating uh, nowadays. But we have different platforms of uh, vaccines for COVID-19. We have the mRNA vaccine, we have the adenoviral factor vaccine, and um, we have also recombinant proteins and killed whole virus vaccine. Now, vaccines may not give significant impact on every uh, personal health. However, it does give massive impact on community health. As we have observed now that we, uh, we are out of the pandemic already and we have to, to thank people who developed uh, the vaccines for us. So uh, although the world has been freed from smallpox or, well, not COVID-19, it is still circulating, we must guarantee the availability of vaccine for any future 
uh, pandemic situation. So we have to prepare for the next pandemic caused either by natural agents that's still circulating in nature or by genetic modified organisms created by bad scientists. Now I have to mention this because it is very possible that anyone um, can create new viruses. Uh, we know that young people nowadays, they are very good. They learn from the internet. They know about bioinformatics. They know how to combine genes together. And at the end, uh, disaster can occur. So uh, we need to seriously prepare ourselves for any possibilities. Now, which vaccine platforms should we work on to prepare the world against potential pandemic surprises? We know that with the COVID-19 experience, we have the, uh, excuse me, I cannot see it uh, clearly. We have the uh, recombinant protein, which means they use uh, RBD region of the uh, of the spike protein of coronavirus. So just a little bit of the spike protein here. So if you have a the spike protein, it's actually uh, this big, but then you can take a little bit of the uh, protein part that actually plays a role in antiviral infection. Also, we have an activated vaccine uh, that contains SARS coronavirus grow in cells. Of course, it's of them have advantages and disadvantages. Also, there are what we call as live attenuated vaccine, uh, meaning that the virus or uh, organism, it can be a uh, bacterial vaccine as well, of course, but it can be attenuated, meaning that we make the organism weaker so that we can use it as vaccine. Polyvirus, uh, polyvirus vaccine is one of the example. Uh, of course, there are uh, possibilities that it may refer back to become the wild type and uh, threat uh, our uh, public health. Um, also, we have the recombinant uh, protein cells vaccines, and then we have the what we call as far life vaccines. They are basically uh, empty viruses, so they don't have any genetic material inside, meaning that they, they cannot replicate at all. But the structure is a mimicking or exactly the same with the actual virus. So it can stimulate a uh, stronger immunity uh, due to the uh, repetitive structure on the surface of uh, the virus. Also, we can have a uh, viral vector vaccine. This uh, one is a replication in the vector. So the virus cannot replicate. But we are just using the virus for one uh, one time delivery, so it it will deliver genetic material into the cells, and then from there the gene that is being delivered will be expressed as antigenic protein. So the actual uh, actual vaccine is the protein expressed by the delivered gene. <clears throat> also, we can have replic rep replication competent factor vaccine. So in this case, the organism is still replicating, but we introduce the vaccine gene to the uh, microorganism gene. So as the either it is bacteria or virus replicate, it will also uh, express the foreign protein, which is the uh, vaccine. Now we can have inactivated virus factor vaccine carrying copies of the spike protein on the surface that have been chemically uh, inactivated. So uh, with this one, uh, the, the virus is a whole uh, virus, but it is a factor vaccine, uh, but it has been chemically inactivated. But inside, you can have copies of the, uh, so, sorry, it's not inside, it's on the surface of the virus, you can have the uh, the the antigenic vaccine. So the virus here may not be COVID nineteen. It may be other viruses. But on the surface, you have COVID nineteen spiked 
protein, which is uh, antigenic, and it induces neutralization antibodies. Also, you can have what we call as naked DNA vaccine. So it means that if it's using DNA, the viral vector vaccine can be uh, DNA as well. But with the viral vector vaccine, it is within the virus. So it is delivered by the virus. But in this case, you can have just DNA and using it uh, as a uh, vaccine platform. The other one, the last one, is the RNA vaccine, which we are quite familiar on uh, with the Pfizer vaccine and also Moderna uh, vaccine. This has been quite a success and a lot of attention uh, is currently being given to this RNA vaccine. But is this the only one? What about DNA vaccine? Now, protein is a potent antigen for a material that stimulates immune response towards invading uh, infectious agents. All of the vaccine platforms that I just uh, explained uh, should be able to function as an antigenic protein that effectively stimulates effective immune response against invading organisms. Now, uh, some of the vaccine platforms are already available as antigenic protein preparation. For example, the inactivated pathogen, whether it is virus, bacteria, uh, and so on. But also, we have the live accumulated weakened pathogen. Uh, this can uh, act as a protein preparation because the virus that has been accumulated, it, it contains the virus protein, of course, that can stimulate immune response. Also, you can have the combinant protein, which is just part of the viral protein being expressed uh, in other forms. They can be produced in bacteria, in yeast, uh, in insect cells, and seed right? or e even in mammalian cells. In the case of uh, COVID 19 recombinant protein vaccine, some of them are being produced in mammalian uh, cells, like uh, Cho cells, for example. Now we have also the viral right? particle, they're all in the form of uh, readily uh, of, uh, available as uh, protein, antigenic protein that can directly stimulate immune response. But the other vaccine platforms have to enter our cell in order to produce antigenic protein, which is the mRNA vaccine. If it cannot enter the cell, then it will not be able to produce the antigenic protein. The mRNA is destroyed, then it will not be able to produce the protein. And as we know, mRNA is quite sensitive to uh, disruption. The light accumulated weakened pathogen also, as they replicate, they will produce antigenic proteins. So they can be uh, acting as directly as antigenic protein, that's as they go into our body, they can stimulate immune responses, but also they can replicate in our body, and as they replicate, they produce the antigenic protein. Also, with the replication in competent factor vaccine and replication in competent factor vaccine, they have to deliver genetic material into uh, our cells, and inside our cells, antigenic protein juice. Likewise, with mRNA vaccine and our topic today, DNA vaccine. <clears throat> of course, like with the availability of all of those uh, vaccine platforms, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we may discuss this later on, but there are too many here. But at least uh, we see here that uh, some of the important uh, advantage that you are looking for is, for example, um, no infectious virus needs to be handled. Uh, in the case of a uh, whole viral vaccine, either they are weakened or they are uh, killed, then you need to produce the virus. And of course, there is uh, a threat here where it can be released to the environment or to anyone working with it. Um, also, what we are looking at is the development of long-lasting immunity. Now, we, we do have the mRNA vaccine, but actually, the, protect, the protection, we find out later that 
it is offline broadcast. So there is a challenge there. How can we have uh, an mRNA vaccine that is uh, stimulating long lasting immunity? In the case of the DNA vaccine, this is definitely the case. It can develop long lasting immunity because the DNA uh, will not be destroyed uh, easily. The DNA with RNA vaccine, you inject the person with RNA, the RNA will come into our body in abundance, which will enter ourselves and produce a lot of antigens, but they will be destroyed very quickly. And with that, of course, you, you only will get a quick spike of uh, protein uh, production in our body, and it will stimulate immune, immune responses, but it is not long lasting. Um, so, of course, like we want to have um, also low cost manufacturing. DNA vaccine certainly fill these characteristics. And um, now with an activated virus, you can help it yourself. I think I have explained to you about the danger of uh, having to culture the virus with RNA uh, vaccine. Nowadays, it's becoming low cost and easy uh, and ease of manufacturing. However, as I've mentioned before, uh, there is a problem in a stimulation of long lasting immunity. With DNA vaccines, the advantage is, uh, of course, just like RNA vaccine, you don't need to handle infectious particles. It is easier to produce the a DNA vaccine. And also, what is good about DNA vaccine that it is uh, temperature stable and also uh, most likely you can be free of cold chain. Uh, you know, like the need to maintain uh, the vaccine preparation in uh, low temperature. Of course, there is still these disadvantages, which is the challenge that we need to overcome. The title remains low, even though it elicits both cytotoxic and humoral immunity. But this is something that it, uh, which is very important. It stimulates both cell mediated immune response and also antibody response in the humoral immunity. And also, some people still worry about potential integration of human genome that may cause abnormalities. With subunit vaccine, uh, you can use it in immunocompromised patients, and also it does not involve any life component of the viral particles. Now, this is the idea of vaccine recording uh, in my observation. It can be easily designed to adapt with rapidly occurring mutations that change antigen structure, shorter time and easy to manufacture, safe, of course, is in mobility, so you can easily um, store and transport the vaccine. Also, um, long lasting immunity, which I have explained previously. Now with DNA vaccination, we have the advantage, uh, advantages of the design. It's quite easy to generate the vaccine. It's, uh, so you can have, you can exercise simple engineering uh, also for modifications of the vaccine. Uh, anything you can change from the promoter, if you have to judge the promoter to the desired target cells that you want to get to vaccine, uh, DNA vaccine into. And also you can optimize the uh, codons. Codon, uh, I hope many of you understand, but this is the, the code for amino acid that builds protein. So we can change the code so that it can be suitable with the host. So we can make it so that it will be produced, it can produce a lot of proteins in human cells or animal cells, according to the host. And also, uh, nowadays we have a lot of understanding in genomics uh, that we can apply to uh, vaccine data construction. Mm -hmm. Time to manufacture is rapid, so we can exercise rapid production and formulation of the NFC. Also, it is safe. It, uh, I think what's important that I don't mention here is that 
DNA vaccine will not stimulate inflammatory reaction as severe as mRNA vaccine. With mRNA vaccine, when it handles our, our cells, it can stimulate cytokine production. And uh, probably some of you have read that uh, it does create problem in young people as well, heart problem. Um, yeah, and the stability, of course, is something that uh, very superior in comparison to the other uh, platforms. Mobility, you can easily store and transport the vaccine because, and as I mentioned, that you don't require, maybe you may not require a whole chain depending on the preparation that you uh, uh, made. Yeah. And also with immunogenicity, it reduced antigen specific T cell and T cell responses similar to those elicited by live attenuated platforms or even the virus, the original pathogen cell, especially viruses. Now, what is the history of DNA vaccine? So in 1992, we actually uh, observed that uh, actually you can uh, use uh, in a gene therapy experiment. So actually it was designed for gene therapy when at the end, what happened was that uh, antibody was produced here in the mice. So from there, we understand that actually we can use DNA uh, to generate, to induce antibody uh, production to specific antigens. And then continues on to uh, protective studies in animal and also naming of technology by uh, WHO. Uh, of course, WHO have to pay attention to the development of uh, DNA vaccine. And in 1995, first prophylactic phase two human uh, trial um, was conducted. This was for human influenza vaccine, but it was never published due to uh, not a uh, something here. So I, I will not say anything because I forgot. Uh, what it was, but eventually it wasn't uh, published. But actually, it occurred in 1995. So many things actually happened without us knowing. So FDA points to consider for DNA based vaccine in 1996, and in between 1998 to 2023, various different types of vaccines for different types of uh, microorganisms and also for cancer was being developed and clinical trial DNA vaccine for SARS coronavirus 2 from India and the phase three clinical trial result showed the efficacy was 66.7%. And of course this is a continuing continuing to explore combining other vaccine platforms with DNA enhanced method for delivery and new molecular antigen. For example, if you combine DNA vaccine with protein-based vaccine you have a much significant uh, improvement in the stimulation of uh, immune responses. Now, this is how DNA looks like. I believe many of you know is this triple helix structure, or double, sorry, double helix structure. And you have the ACE, T, G, C uh, sequences here. Um, I don't know for too long about this, but this is something important to understand with DNA vaccine. Now, with DNA being able to be used to uh, produce protein, it has to be inside the <laughs> nucleus of the inside the nucleus of a cell. And inside the nuclear compartment, um, it will then be used to transcribe RNA. The RNA will then be used for protein production in ribosome. Uh, the process of this translation. So with this, we know that DNA vaccine has to enter the nuclear compartment in order to function as a vaccine by producing antigenic protein. So of course, again, it is a protein that functions and stimulates the immune response. So if the DNA get into the cell, but does not enter the nuclear compartment, then it will not 
be used for transcription of RNA, hence you will not get protein. Now, in comparison with mRNA vaccine, what you get with mRNA, with mRNA vaccine, they just go into the cytoplasm, cytoplasmic compartment, and then it will go directly to the ribosome and then be used for protein production. But of course, uh, there is a problem with stability of the RNA to, to exist in the nuclear, in the cytoplasmic compartment. It is different with DNA vaccine. When DNA vaccine is updated by the cells, then even though it, 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 it's, uh, it is successful to enter the cytoplasmic compartment, there is a problem. It may not escape the endosome. And if it, it cannot escape the endosome, it cannot gain entry into the nuclear compartment. Even if it has escaped the endosome, it doesn't mean that it can enter the nuclear compartment. There are uh, requirements for the DNA to get into the nuclear compartment, especially in the case of non-dividing cells. See here, if the cell is not dividing, the nuclear membrane is intact. So this becomes a barrier for the DNA to get into the nuclear compartment. It cannot just go in there. It needs what we call as active transportation. And for that, it needs what we call as nuclear localization sequence, either in the DNA itself or a protein binds with this DNA, but the protein also has nuclear localization sequence. So nuclear localization sequence can be in the form of nucleic acid sequence, but it can also be in the form of uh, amino acid sequence uh, as protein. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, in comparison to the other vaccine platforms, DNA vaccine is yet not as successful as the other platform. So it has a lot of numbers, but it also has its own problem. And most of it is related with the ability to enter the nuclear compartment of non dividing cells because most of our cells are in, in, uh, in non dividing forms. So, what fails, I have explained to you. I think it's quite easy to understand now that naked DNA does not readily cross a cell and membrane. So, instruction efficiency is very low, while the seduction is mediated by endosomal uptake, it's delivered to DNA in the cytosol. So, you need to make the DNA uh, to go through this endosomal uh, uptake. Uh, in our laboratory, we use uh, what we call as cell penetrating peptide to enable the DNA to penetrate through the um, cytoplasmic membrane. And in order for the DNA to be transported to the nucleus uh, or the nuclear compartment, that what we did, we, uh, we also use um, nuclear localization sequence so that the DNA can, but uh, in our experiments, we use a uh, nuclear localization sequence in the form of a uh, peptide sequence, not in the form of nucleic acid sequence. I don't think we have published that uh, so, uh, very well. There's some a little bit of information uh, that has been published, uh, but uh, so far, to my understanding, what other people have done, they use nucleic acid um, nuclear localization sequence. Now. Yeah, so it has been explained. Uh, if the DNA cannot get into, it is not protected, then as we inject the DNA, it can be destroyed by enzyme that we call as nuclease. So there is a challenge here in order to get into the nuclear compartment. Also, it has to be able to pass through the lipid bilayer. So DNA is negatively charged and lipid bilayer is negatively charged. Um, but it is not as easy to gain entry. So 
we can use uh, liposomes here. Um, once entering cells through endosome DNA, you'll be degraded in the liposome. So you need to protect the DNA. In our case, we use DNA binding peptides that protect the DNA from uh, degradation with inside the cell. And again, to enable the DNA to pass through the uh, nuclear membrane, you see here that there are some cells. Then we use the nuclear replication sequence. Um, but um, DNA vaccine has actually been uh, studied a lot, and many optimization has been uh, practiced. You see here that we can start from the plasmid itself uh, being optimized, the sequences being used in the plasmid construct. Also, the gene itself has been optimized. You uh, exercise uh, codon uh, optimization and also high GC content, etc. And try to avoid certain things like introducing the kernel data boxes here. Tricides, ribosomal endocytes, etc., and also with uh, formulation of adjuvant, uh, it can be used to enhance uh, DNA vaccination and immune plasmid adjuvants such as cytokine etc., or like example as well. And we have various delivery systems that has been studied: intramuscular, alcoholization, transcutaneous myelination, skin abrasion, gene gun, ultrasound, tattoo. Or percolating needle death injector and topical patch, and in our case, we try to use delivery peptides. So, uh, DNA vaccine, how does it work? So, as you inject, this is the oldest version of DNA uh, administration. It, uh, it, it was uh, injected into the muscle side. Nowadays, of course, you can inject different um, uh, tissues. And within the muscle tissue, what can happen? The DNA can enter the muscle tissue, and then it can be uh, expressed into protein inside the muscle tissue, my side here. But also, what is interesting, it can also transfect dendritic cells, antigen presented cells. And uh, if it can it, uh, transfect, Antigen presented cells, we know that the antigen can migrate, migrate into um, the uh, lymph node. Now, uh, while in the case of the myocytes uh, being constructed, it will produce what we call as exogenous antigen. So, antigen is secreted from the myocyte. In this case here, uh, you can have either secreted antigen uh, delivered by the antigen presenting cells, but also it can um, be expressed on the surface of cell NHC class 1. Now, the beauty of um, antigen presenting cells, it is mobile, so it will move. It will move together with antigen apoptotic bodies. So basically, at the end, with DNA vaccine, you will get uh, exogenous antigen and endogenous antigen being carried by the antigen presenting cells, migrating through the afferent lymphatic vessel into the lymph node. And inside the lymph node, the uh, antigen presenting cell will make contact with CD4 uh, T cells. Because it can also uh, phagocytose the exogenous antigen, hence it will uh, express the peptide on uh, on any sorry on any MHC plus two, and if it is presented on MHC plus two, it will stimulate the little T cells. Now, the one that is being produced inside the cytoplasmic compartment, they will be chopped by proteases. And then they will be expressed on MHC class one, and we know it will uh, stimulate CD8 T cells, which are important for protection against uh, especially viral infection and cancer. 
Now, the exogenous antigen will also directly stimulate B cells, and the B cells will, of course, and get amplified so that it will produce uh, uh, antibody, specific antibody to the antigen. The B cell itself within the lymph node will make contact with CD4 B cells and it will be stimulated so that it can become uh, a more long lasting uh, immune uh, response. Now, finally, we will have specific B cell CD8 and CD4 coming out from the enteric lymphatic vessel to protect our whole body. Now, this is just showing you that uh, some uh, groups actually have combined DNA with protein. And it is interesting to observe here that if you use the uh, DNA, so DP here stands for DNA, combination of DNA and protein. If you use the, um, in the third dose, you are using a uh, combination of DNA and protein, even though they are initially uh, immunized for dose one and dose three with either inactivated vaccine or uh, viral factor vaccine, adenovirus, for example, but also with RNA vaccine, you will get a high stimulation of um, this, uh, screen cells uh, that produce IG, IgG. Now, it is interesting to see that also with T helper 1 and T helper 2, you've got a superior stimulation if the dose used. Um, DNA and protein combination. So they, they are stronger. Here it is stronger, and here it is stronger as well. Uh, with first dose being immunized with uh, an activated vaccine, uh, adenoviral factor vaccine, and RNA vaccine as well. So it is interesting that both T helper 1 and T helper 2 uh, T cells are actually uh, can have a higher stimulation even in use. DNA and protein combination at the third uh, dose for the vaccination. Also, a similar here, uh, just showing the neutralization antibody titan. It gets superior uh, stimulation if you um, use the last uh, dose with uh, DNA and protein, this the pink one here. And they are all superior even though you're using the uh, use the antibody for neutralization of the first uh, first COVID 19 uh, virus, also with the beta strains, delta, and omicron. Okay, so this is just uh, showing you that they have also tried DNA vaccination. This is top. Of course, there are some new studies. I'm just picking one of them. And it worked uh, quite well, even though they are just using DNA in recess macaw. And this is uh, a colleague of mine. She was studying DNA vaccine in 1998. Uh, Nearly, she's from Indonesia, she's now in Bosch company. And she studied uh, DNA vaccine against Dachypotitis B virus. And she showed that actually elimination of the virus uh, occurs using DNA vaccine. That was in 1986. It was quite early. Okay, so uh, also we can use DNA vaccine for cancer therapy. So it is a hope for cancer immunotherapy. Question, is it for infectious diseases? Now, uh, we see here that DNA immunization and DNA-based immunotherapies can be used for infectious diseases as target, but also for cancer. Now with cancer, you can use DNA to produce uh, antibody. So inject the DNA that express uh, antibody against um, the cancer. If the, can the cancer cell has uh, you know, unique 
uh, set of markers on it, then you can use antibody to destroy it. But also you can stimulate uh, CD8 uh, responses to kill the cancer cells. The main component of DNA vaccines, uh, you can have uh, the bacterial component and also the gene that you insert into uh, the vaccine. Uh, those of you who studied molecular biology remember very well what I'm talking about. Uh, but we need to choose the appropriate plasma. And now we have got um, new generations of plasmids that can be used. Uh, that is recommended actually to be used for DNA vaccination. They are in the form of minicircle and nanoplasmid. The last one here, uh, I believe, is the better one. The plasmid, you still have um, antibiotic resistant, sheet, resistant genes that you don't want to use too much because it can create problems with antimicrobial uh, resistance. Uh, and you don't want to get too many, uh, or you, you really want to get rid of the bacterial DNA uh, in the plasmid. So here, the conventional plasmid, you have the expression module. This is the one that is being used for expression of our antigenic protein. But also, you have the bacterial DNA here that can cause you problem. It can um, cause problem uh, as... Uh, because you have direct repeats, for example, it can cause niche information defense and also the occurrence of spontaneous transposition of, mo uh, of mobile elements, which is the insertion sequence. And this can cause problems as well, because apart from being inserted, for example, here next to the antimicrobial resistance genes, it can also be inserted somewhere else. And if it happens, then they will recombine and the module can be destroyed as well. Now, we have the minicircle uh, plasmid. So this was promising because you can get rid of the bacterial DNA. So no bacterial backbone, high expression efficiency, reduced transgene silencing, no rate of packaging in AAP, adeno-associated virus, for example. It has been used in clinical uh, research for target cells almost no cargo size restriction, so you can insert large size uh, of DNA and it's available on large scale. Uh, so this is the advantages. Increased yield, reduced cost, free of antibiotic patient juice, free of antibiotic sequences, free of any bacterial selection markers, reduced toxicity, and already meets future regulatory requirements. So WHO has issued the, re the regulation for DNA vaccine and minicircle plasmid actually uh, for cure the criteria. Um, not going to speak too much about this, all, but it is difficult uh, for manufacturing of minicircles. It is a laborious process. You have to go through many, through multiple steps, and uh, it is lacking the producibility at the large scale. So not that easy because you have to separate the bacterial DNA from the DNA that you want to use for stimulating the response. Now, here we have, sorry, with entering here, we have the nanoplasmic. Uh, it only has your own factor. And also it has uh, what we call here as nanoplasmic RNA out. Uh, R6K. So it is small, highest expression, longest duration, low toxicity, no antibiotic markers, and it is compliant to the uh, WHO regulation. Now, with the nanoplasmid, actually, uh, they use um, bacterial cells that uh, have the uh, SACB. So the bacterial host genome has the SACB gene. Uh, that will create a toxic environment in the presence of sucrose. So if you culture the bacteria with sucrose, then the bacteria will die. But if your DNA uh, that contains the uh, RNA out gene get into the bacterial cell, then what will happen? 
it will produce uh, an M out uh, a sorry it is a antisense RNA yeah. that will block the function of the sac B messenger RNA. And with that, the uh, leaf and suppress, suppress enzyme will not be able to create toxic environment by infecting the sugar. So the bacteria that got this plasmid can actually still survive in the presence of sucrose. So that is a very good, I think it's very smart. <laughs> uh, now with antigens, you also need to choose them properly. So it's not just the DNA. You have to design the DNA, the, the protein itself or the genes that express the protein so that it can stimulate neutralization antibody, antibody, antibody dependent cytotoxicity, ADCC, B cell activation, T helper one and T helper two, and also CD8 cytotoxic T cells. And it is important to design your protein so that it will stimulate the appropriate immunogenicity and antigenicity that you want to um, to be able to work against the pathogenic agent. Also, you can eliminate toxic and allergenic uh, sequences within the protein. And you can use, of course, like bioinformatic tools to, uh, to uh, analyze this and also observe potential cross-reactivity with other microorganisms or human persons, which can be uh, dangerous, of course. If it, uh, there is cross-reactivity with human proteins, we know that will create cultural immunity. And also diversity of the target protein. Maybe this highly diverse, and this difficult. HIV, for example, is a very difficult uh, virus uh, for creating a vaccine because the envelope region is uh, Mutates really easily. Okay, so you also have problem with codon bias. Not going to speak too much too much about this, but also there are sequences that you need to observe really well. I think I've explained a little bit about this in the previous slides. Uh, now, with the DNA vaccine production, uh, there are requirements. Uh, uh, in Indonesia, we have the guidelines for drug production. I, I believe in your country as well, everywhere else. And with that, of course, if we want to produce DNA vaccine, it has to be the safety and efficacy quality criteria. Now, safety issues and other problems regarding DNA vaccine is integration. We don't want the DNA to integrate into the cells, but as I had mentioned before, the majority of our cells are in the form of non dividing cells. And homologous recombination or integration of DNA vaccine can only occur during um, cell replication. Also, autoimmunity, this is something that was that people worry in the past, but studies have shown that it is unlikely. Now, anti-nuclear or disease-associated anti-DNA antibodies have been detected. Um, so we, we worry the development of auto-antibodies against immune adjuvant. We have to examine patients for science of auto-immunity using laboratory markers. Antibiotic resistance, of course, we have overcome this problem with uh, the nanoplasmids uh, that I have explained previously. And, uh, this is what we have the most in terms of the problem, in that it is uh, it has low immunogenicity. First generation DNA plasmid is a slow level of T cell and B cell memories. That is why we have to use novel formulations, immune plasmid adjuvants, and delivery systems to enhance immunogenicity. Run this approach that I have explained before can become one of the solutions well. And I think I've mentioned this, that there is uh, an established guidelines by WHO for quality assurance and safety evaluation of the DNA vaccine. And of course, we have to go through all this. And as you study uh, all the WHO guidelines, then you will learn that the source history and generation of the host cell is also important. Uh, the source of the cells, bacteria, host cell, phenotype, and genotype, 
Uh, we need to consider that very carefully. And of course, there are hundreds of things that we have to understand. Um, how do I go through this? You can have my slides if you're interested. Then this is what needs to be avoided as well. The long terminal repeat sequence, because this can cause integration due to, uh, you know, this is a retro transposome sequence, long terminal repeats at its ends, and this can be uh, potentially causing danger of integration into our genome as well. Um, also, use of on oncogenes, we have to be careful with that. And also, we have to perform DNA sequence for multi plasmic with the international database. And investigate the presence of unintended sequences of biological significance. But this is not as difficult as I don't know. It seems complicated, but as you exercise it, uh, it's quite easy. Like an uh, undergraduate student can easily do that. Um, okay, so how to enhance efficacy? Use smaller size plasmid, liver system. You can use living organism, you can use bacteria. Viruses, also physical uh, method, nanoparticle, needle free injector, electroporation. And in our case, we use delivery peptides, so the cell penetrating peptides, adjutant, and also in combination with recombinant antigen. So, bacterial factor can be used to deliver DNA vaccine. It can be a living bacteria, attenuated bacteria. Also, you can use what we call as ghost bacteria. So, the bacteria is actually is not replicating anymore, but it can still deliver, uh, you know, substances um, as well as DNA vaccine. Or if you just mainly use it to enhance immunity instead of DNA vaccine, uh, so physical delivery methods. You got the needle-free injection system, so you don't need to puncture into uh, tissue. And also, you got the needle and syringe system. It is quite old function. And also, you have the EP or electroporation. So, you create an electric field here. And also, they have what they call a FEMAC or particle mediated epidermal delivery. Uh, you can read about it yourself later on. The needle jet, needle jet injection, you don't need any. Needle here, ah, uh, so we use needle here, but with the needle inject, you just split the uh, inject the fluid here, and it will uh, go into the tissue. It has to be really strong, of course, uh, and it has advantages and disadvantages. Electroporation is one of the uh, most efficient one in terms of stimulating the response, so you can use a small amount of DNA vaccine, and if you use electroporation, it will create uh, good immunity. However, there is still a problem in, you know, uh, in transporting the electroporation. And people now work on creating small electroporators that you can uh, use it as a portable device, handheld, uh, and easy to carry. I think they use the electric. Uh, you know, when you want to create a sparks for uh, if you're a smoker, for example. Uh, okay, so basically, electroporation is very good, but it is, uh, it has its own problem as well in terms of production of electroporator in an economical scale. Um, also, you can use nanoparticle and with the use of nanoparticles we have to make sure that it can translocate to the nucleus in order for it for the dna to be start start with the rna and here are efficacy and immunogenicity of various dna delivery system you see that self penetrating peptides are actually are quite superior in comparison to the others um, well, this is what we have in our laboratory so we developed the peptide and we observed that if you are using our peptides, uh, it is using lipopectamine, it is not working at all in non-blind cells. Here we use plastic adherent human PBMC 
most likely the monocytes, so they are not replicating. That is probably, uh, I think that's the reason why uh, using just like a factor mean, uh, it's not a <laughs> But if you're using our peptide, either just the peptide itself or in combination with lipofactamine, then you will get a good uh, signal, increased signal above the uh, control control level here. So the lipofactamine, uh, it is not different with the, with the negative control. But there are other problems as well, uh, because if you want to create, to, to um, introduce the DNA vaccine into the lymphatic cells, then you observe there are other things that you need to include as well. Promoters, for example, um, the RNA that is being prescribed, you need to um, design the structure properly so that it can be uh, translated really well in, for example, the lymphatic cells. Uh, it, so I think this is why I have repeated this uh, many, many times. But here, I just want to show you that targeting the NF vaccine into the lymphatic cells is very important. Uh, I have explained to you how the lymphatic cells actually work for the NF vaccine. But also, uh, if you target the DNA vaccine specifically to the lymphatic cells, it may potentially reduce the dose of DNA vaccine and also reduce the risk of systemic dissemination because they are all the DNA being trapped by the lymphatic cells. Mm -hmm. The prospect, of course, like if we see here of DNA vaccine, this is weeks from access to pandemic virus RNA. So this is in the past. You need to get access to virus RNA. So this is in 2009. Um, everyone asked for the H5N1 influenza virus, including the virus for Indonesia. So you need to get access to the RNA. Nowadays, you just need access to the amino acid sequence. Of course, then you can create your own DNA or design your DNA better than the original sequence. Now here, uh, we see that from the first week, uh, you get the virus RNA or sequence, then you can start producing in week 10 and then release for delivery starting from week 12, 13 and so on. So this is really life-saving in a pandemic situation. And uh, with DNA vaccine, you have uh, the advantage that it is more identical to protein in nature because it is produced by our own cells. Viruses are also produced by our own cells. So meaning you can get the structure of the protein uh, as close as possible to the original structure. While if you produce it in uh, bacterial cell or in um, mosquito cells, then the structure may be slightly different, even if you produce it in these cells. And the good thing about the NF vaccine is stimulates both CD4 and CD4 cells apart from stimulation of B cells. It is relatively simple and inexpensive to design and manufacture. It, uh, it reduces long-term immunity. Um, also, it is safe. Um, it can create a immune response for a specific antigen. And also, the uh, advantage of DNA vaccine is fragility. I think I've mentioned this before. And of course, there are uh, this one, disadvantages that we need to work on. Uh, so large scale GMP standard manufacturing can be done quickly, easy to produce in large scale in a short period after the protein target has been identified, and also you don't use infectious agents. Now, actually, sorry. Uh, this is during the H5N1 influenza uh, outbreak. The company produced, uh, it's called Powermet, they produced this technology. and. Uh, they claim that just 1.2 kilogram of DNA vaccine will be sufficient to vaccinate the entire population of US. We come to the presentation and recommendation. I'm sorry to uh, make you listen for so long, but DNA vaccine is a promising candidate to be further developed for infectious disease prevention and pandemic preparedness, as well as for cancer treatment. 
modification of plastic structure, addition of adjutant and use of delivery system that enable transportation to the nuclear compartment, as well as targeting DNA vaccines to dendritic cells may increase the effectiveness, safety, and quality of DNA vaccine. Uh, is in design and manufacture uh, stability and ability to produce long-term immunity are traits of DNA vaccine that have potential for economical reduction. So it is basically the most economical vaccine if we, we, we are successful in making uh, the DNA vaccine to be uh, highly efficient. Also, it is good for storage, dissemination of the vaccines and for distribution. In, in the case of Indonesia, we have a lot of islands and it is difficult to transfer vaccine. So it is very good if we can create a DNA vaccine that, work, that works really well. And this is my recommendation, the investment for collaboration between OIC scientists for improvement of DNA vaccine is beneficial for ex acceleration to a safe and highly effective as well as for solo factor. This is important in uh, countries where we have the majority of Muslim uh, in Indonesia as well. So hand in hand, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim scientists we work together to create a halal platform. In fact, this is mandatory. In Indonesia, you cannot produce non-halal biopharmaceutical products nowadays. So um, we hope that we can do this so that we can help our Muslim brothers and sisters uh, within uh, OIC uh, organization, but also all over the world. And with that, thank, I thank you for your attention and I will give my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Bella, for a very nice and a very uh, well put together presentation. I hope that our audience, uh, both in person and uh, virtually, uh, have gained a lot from your presentation, inshallah. Uh, now, moving on to the question answers, uh, we have five minutes for the question and answer. Uh, do we have question here in the audience? Sir, please introduce yourself. We have discussed the topic very comprehensively, and we have just learned to cover almost all the aspects. One thing I would like to know is uh, what is the probability of the protein misfolding uh, leading to genesis of new problems, for instance, uh, primons uh, in case of DNA vaccine? Yes, please. Yes, you're very right. In the case of COVID 19 spike, and we know that it has a drive in different regions. In Indonesia, we are finding uh, CRISPR to take up this patient nowadays after COVID 19. I don't know whether it was due to our younger clinicians is becoming more and more sensitive, but that is the first. We have the first formation of uh, CRISPR to take up this the prior, prior disease. Now, uh, I suppose what we need to do is to exercise uh, bioinformatics technology. So that we can observe uh, sequence of homologies whether we have the structure that can be required. Or we can try to do some genes into the vaccine. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, while using DNA vaccines, you have a third uh, reaction in your response compared to. Okay, I think that. Number one, if we can make it uh, induce high immune response, of course, like there are strategies that I have explained, if we can make the DNA get into the visual compartment of non divided cells and also use promoters that can be recognized. Uh, very well by our target cells. There's not, not every promoter can work in every cells, we know that. 
So you need to choose your target cells. And if you want to make your DNA actually get into the target cells, make sure you adjust the promoter in front of your uh, gene that, uh, you know, um, and go to the antigen. Uh, so that's one thing. Now, ability to um, induce long lasting immunity. I think that is something that is very important in comparison with mRNA vaccine that we know, yeah, it can be effective there and uh, expensive in terms of distribution. Yes, we can make it, you can make production uh, low, more economical, but you still have the problem with distribution and storage. As well as the delivery, of course. Yeah, the delivery is quite challenging itself, but at least uh, we've got the experience that it helps us through the pandemic uh, situation. But we need to continue on working uh, for the pandemic preparation to get a much better vaccine. So you may combine DNA vaccine with protein, uh, but in our group, we believe that we also need to uh, design the DNA really well and also try to use um, delivery peptides that are safer. The, the one that I showed to you use spiral sequences. Mm -hmm. And of course, it has, apart from the DNA itself, has to be safe, the delivery system has to be safe as well. Yes. But at least our proof of concept, I mean, we can we have the concept, uh, the proof of concept that it can work using peptides, but now we need to create a safe peptide. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have another question? Uh, okay, madam, kindly introduce yourself. I have a question that is there any free treatment that is available from cellular environment compared to the drugs for the DNA or mRNA vaccine? Any free treatment that is available for making the cellular environment compatible for the mRNA or DNA vaccine? Has, uh, uh, we have see, see that the, the major barrier is the cellular environment uh, involving uh, making the DNA vaccine or mRNA, mRNA vaccine less effective. Okay, mRNA, I think we are very good number with the uh, nano microscope. So the nano microscope technology that has been developed is really good nowadays. Problem is with is that the technology is currently. Uh, it is um, it is a monopoly by those big pharmaceutical companies. So uh, there is a movement in low and middle income countries to be able to produce our own nano life so that uh, will have freedom to operate. So we don't have to uh, uh, face taken violation of problem. Now, so with mRNA, I don't think there's a problem. A lot of scientists is working with even with the amount of life or so. Um, but with DNA, so the strategy to make the cell to become more conducive for the DNA to enter the cell and even if you need the function is the electroporation. But using electroporator, you create steel, you just touch the skin with the electroporator and then introduce electric forces. It is not, you know, that the really small uh, 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 electric pulse, uh, and that will open up the membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane will open up, it will easily, it will make the DNA to, to get into the cytoplasmic compartment easily, and also at the same time, the nuclear compartment is open. So DNA can leak into the nucleus. But we haven't talked about specific delivery into the nucleic cells. Yet. That is why I also mentioned that if you can specifically deliver the DNA into the nucleic cells, then it will make the DNA technology uh, more efficient. And there are methods in, for that. Certain uh, uh, surface proteins belonging to the nucleic cells have been identified and uh, they are candidates uh, for targeting of DNA vaccine into the cells. Thank you very much, madam.
So why we are not directly uh, delivering the antigenic protein that is activating the immune system along with the adjuvants? Because as we are seeing, uh, DNA, uh, the DNA that we are delivering also has nuclear and cell barrier. So why not protein, antigenic protein? Thank you. So yeah, that is a, that is a very good question. In fact, that is what we are doing as well. Uh, but of course, like there are other possibilities of safety, etc. What we try to do is to uh, engineer a protein that can just go into the cytoplasmic membrane. So it can penetrate into uh, the cytoplasmic compartment. And it can, it can go there, it can be chopped off into small peptides that can be presented on any simple one. Because that is the problem with protein. You can only uh, generate because it is an exogenous antigen, so it will it will stimulate CD forty cells and antibody, but not CD eight. So that is why we try to make this protein penetrate into uh, the cell membrane, uh, and with that we produce the cell penetrating peptide so that it can go into the into the Side of but doesn't have to go into the Do we have we had another question from here? Didn't we have? Okay, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, I have a question that what odds do we have in developing the uh, dendritic cell lymphoma and other lymphoproliferative disorders? Since uh, uh, there are other antigen presenting cells in the tissues besides dendritic cells. Okay, so uh, if, if you're, uh, you probably have your own. Uh, yes, uh, in case of uh, B cells, which are the active and this is antigen presenting cell, if we, uh, by accident or, or with the delivery, to transform them into antigen presenting cells with the DNA that is in cooperative, they are highly divided by each other. What are the odds of developing the lymphoproliferative disorder in cancer? Okay, so you worry that the proliferating uh, cell into the DNA gets into the proliferating cell and then it can integrate into the chromosomal DNA of that proliferating cell and get the lymphoma. Yes. That's a very good question. I always worry about that as well. But, um, of course, we thought to whether it's real or not. Mm -hmm. But that is a lot of studies that we uh, made, and so far, uh, we haven't observed any of this. Because in case of uh, uh, human papilloma virus vaccines, so they are, uh, they have seen there that there's a development of uh, disease uh, after the vaccination. Yeah, but if we if we use E6 and E7. Antigen that can actually cause cancer that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can try to cut off the regions of the E6 or E7 proteins molecules in your antigen so that it will interact with if you're not interacting with the epithelial or PRP so that it, it will apoptosis can still occur if the DNA becomes if the cell becomes cancerous. Right? Now, in the case of proliferating uh, these cells, uh, also DNA update, I think that is one of the reasons why we need to direct your DNA vaccine to the different cells. Mm -hmm. Because the different cells are, in terms of cells, yes, yeah, they're not, they cannot proliferate. Mm -hmm. But if you can do that, then it will reduce the resistance. Any other questions here from the participants? 
experience sector will be I must be medical student. My question is from ideal vaccine that we know that uh, the composition uh, the genetic composition of all the viruses keep changing next time. So how uh, if it gets changed in the genetic composition of the virus, then how the ideal vaccine is uh, going to tackle this problem? Okay, thank you. Now, firstly, you have to be able to identify whether there are uh, what we call as, um, I, you know, like conserved sequences. Mm -hmm. A virus uh, is identified as that virus because it has certain sequences. It doesn't completely change, right? It's, that's why, for example, if there's a SARS coronavirus, it, it, because it has certain uh, sequence that belongs to SARS coronavirus. So we can identify those sequences. Now, uh, of course, uh, what you worry more is about neutralizing antibody, right? Because if you change, then even though you, you still stimulate antibody, then you will not be able to neutralize uh, viral antibody. But we know that with viral infection, it is not just antibody that works, or it is not just neutralizing antibody that works against the virus. We have uh, ADCC phenomena where even though the antibody binds to other sequences, it's not neutralizing the virus, but then it can cause change and that will destroy the virus factories, you know, like uh, cells producing virus. Also, um, you can aim at other sequences as well. And with the availability of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, bioinformatic uh, analysis, then you can identify sequences that is well conserved for the stimulation of not just antibody but also CD4 and CD8. Usually, with CD4 and CD8, you have so many options. So that is why uh, with DNA vaccine, I believe that. Um, it can still work because it will stimulate CD8 T cells in other regions that are not there. The cross protection can still occur. I have another question uh, regarding uh, the antibody production. Since you have mentioned that the immunogenicity of the DNA vaccines it produces the antibody with no abilities, uh, what are the odds of having the uh, a viral infection with antibody dependent enhancement of the DNA vaccine? Uh, well, so far, I'm not uh, uh, But yeah, that is, I, I agree that is something that we need to put into consideration. But in your, uh, you can always study whether the uh, antibody that is being produced can actually cause enhancement or not in vitro experiments. So we have a few questions from the online participants as well. Uh, so first question is that um, how to improve immunogenicity of DNA vaccine so that they can be combined with cytokine or other immune stimulator? Okay, so that's a good question. In fact, people have, uh, people are doing that. So uh, we are using... Uh, the DNA that can uh, that can actually uh, act as a co-stimulator uh, to this uh, antigen, for example, or uh, other strategies uh, to enable what is being suggested by the practice is uh, as being used as well. Right. But of course, safety needs to be uh, broader. Uh, so there is another question: uh, Which DNA therapeutic vaccines are in pipeline? And what will be the future of therapeutic DNA vaccines? Okay, so if you try to uh, find in the uh, of this document, there are a lot of publications mentioning about use of DNA vaccine uh, as therapeutic uh, modality. So, in fact, it is something that is more recommended nowadays than uh, being used as um, as preventive vaccine. Uh, do we have any other question here in the audience? So, lady, uh, just lastly, I would like to have one, uh, two comments for Dr. Bella's presentation. Uh, doctor, from this side, anyone from this side? Uh, 
Just say a few words about Dr. Bala's presentation and what you have learned. Madam Yu. Yeah. Just say a few words about Dr. Bala. And very well connected as well. Uh, when uh, the other vaccine is talking, uh, but I am concerned about the other vaccines as well. They should also be considered for equal production with the new Yeah, of course. But again, I'm saying that's very important. It's still that today we are focusing on giving a vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Any other uh, volunteer? Up, uh, but you in the middle. Up. Just say a few words about Dr. Bala's presentation. Well, it was a very good presentation, and I learned a lot of the new things uh, that I want to study here. Yeah. And so you're you're in your undergraduate. You're undergrad. Okay. So this is a good starter for her, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Dr. Bala, thank you very much for your presentation. Really enjoyed it, and I hope that uh, our audience enjoyed it too. Uh, so moving on to the last uh, bit of the technical session, uh, we will open the dialogue on indigenous production of vaccines in the OIC member states. Um, we have one expert from uh, from Pasteur Institute of Iran. Um, we have Professor Dr. Ehsan Mustafavi. Uh, he is a research manager and international relation director at uh, Pasteur Institute of Iran. Uh, <clears throat> Before I in, let me see if he uh, he can hear us and he's connected. Uh, Professor Hassan, can you unmute your mic so that we can see you? Professor Hassan, I have made you co-host. Could you please unmute your mic and also uh, put on your video? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yeah. And uh, my camera is uh, on. Yes, your camera is on. Okay. Yes. Um, so let me, uh, first of all, thank you for your time and for being with us. Um, Professor Dr. Esan Mustafi's talk will encompass uh, the infrastructure and potential capabilities of research and technology pathway, which are present in Pasteur Institute of Iran, uh, and how they are leading toward production of biologicals and vaccines. Professor Hassan, over to you, sir. And uh, thank you. Uh, is my uh, screen shared with uh, all the participants? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, see okay. Us. Okay. Uh, um, thank you. I would like to thank you all for. Um, inviting me to have a presentation in your uh, seminar. Uh, as it was discussed uh, um, here, I want to have a, a brief introduction uh, of Pasteur Institute of Iran uh, as a symbol of health and research services to Iran and the world. As you uh, may know, uh, Pasteur Institute of Iran is a, a member of the Pasteur Network. And the first uh, pastor uh, was established in Paris in uh, 1887. And nowadays we have uh, 33 members uh, worldwide. And uh, Pastor Institute of Iran was uh, established uh, more than uh, 100 years ago uh, as the 10th uh, oldest institute in pastor network. Uh, all the uh, members of the Pastoral Network have close cl collaboration with each other, uh, mainly on, uh, against the infectious diseases. Uh, regarding the uh, history of uh, Pastoral Institute of Iran, during the years it had, uh, has had uh, um, many uh, activities and has been responsible for control of different infectious diseases, including uh, um, pandemic influenza, plague, smallpox, uh, rabies, tuberculosis, malaria, viral hemorrhagic fever, and cholera. Uh, and uh, one of the first and uh, important activities of this institute has been uh, production of the smallpox uh, vaccine 
which was not only uh, used uh, in Iran, but also exported to other uh, neighboring countries uh, to eradicate this uh, important viral infectious disease. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, Pasteur Institute of Iran has been one of the uh, important um, arms for control of uh, this infectious disease in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, another um, uh, first uh, uh, in, um, produced uh, vaccine in our institute has been rabies uh, vaccine. Uh, which uh, in 1922, the Department of Rabies in Pasteur Institute of Iran started production of ra uh, human rabies vaccine. And <clears throat> the, um, also uh, this department has introduced the combination of serum and vaccine for uh, treatment of uh, the rabid um, uh, patients. First of all, to the world, and um, uh, this department is the WHO collaborating center uh, nowadays. Another uh, vaccine that uh, what has been uh, produced in uh, Pasteur Institute of Iran is Besse vaccine uh, to control uh, tuberculosis. Uh, it was uh, first implemented in Iran since 1947. Uh, and, um, um, and the vaccine is uh, exported to uh, 22 countries uh, to control this uh, important disease. During the years, other uh, vaccines, such as uh, a vaccine to control gonorrhea, to control typhoid, anthrax, and cholera, are also produced in Pasteur Institute of Iran and exported to other uh, countries. As I told you, uh, in Pasteur Institute of Iran, uh, one of the main activities is uh, uh, on control and on consultation for control of rabies, not only in Iran, but also in other uh, neighboring countries uh, on rabies. And uh, WHO Collaborating Center on Rabies is working in Pasteur Institute of Iran. We also are going to have the approval for WHO Collaborating Center for Emerging Vector Bone Diseases, which can extend our um, international activities. Um, our uh, activities in Pasteur Institute of Iran is not only on uh, production, but also on research, on uh, educational programs, and on uh, um, uh, laboratory diagnostic services. Uh, based on the laboratory diagnosis services, there are 13 national reference laboratories in Pasteur Institute of Iran, mainly working on infectious diseases. And as, um, it can be discussed that all uh, the non-known uh, agents and outbreaks, uh, the samples are referred to Pasteur Institute of Iran for early diagnosis and uh, supporting the Ministry of Health for control of the uh, different uh, infectious disease outbreaks. In this map, you can see the international collaborations of uh, our researchers uh, from Pasteur Institute of Iran to other countries of the world. As you can see, uh, our um, researchers and our um, uh, collaborate, we have collaborations with uh, different uh, countries of the world, mostly on uh, North America and uh, Europe. One of the main branches of Pasteur Institute of Iran uh, is the production complex branch, uh, which is uh, uh, its main uh, mission is uh, production of the recombinant types, injectable solutions, and vaccines. Um, um, and um, currently nearly 450 people are working in this complex. Nowadays, we are producing BCG vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, rabies vaccine, leophilized BCG interresicular, and Pastocovac and Pastocovac Plus as the vaccine against uh, COVID. Uh, and uh, also, 
we are going uh, to develop uh, rotavirus vaccine by support of uh, uh, some uh, well-known um, um, companies. And also one of the main uh, platforms that is uh, well uh, developed in Pasteur Institute of Iran is conjugated vaccines, which uh, uh, our uh, COVID vaccines, Pasteur Covac and Pasteur Covac Plus, were based on this uh, type of platform. And also we are going to develop a pneumococcal vaccine uh, based on this uh, platform. Uh, one of the main uh, and uh, recent activities of uh, production of Pasteur Institute of Iran uh, was uh, in uh, production of the COVID vaccine by collaboration of, of Finlay Institute of uh, Cuba. And based on that, we uh, uh, produce a vaccine uh, that has had an efficacy of more than 90%, and the data is uh, published in uh, JAMA. As I told you, uh, also in our uh, um, complex uh, production, production complex, we produce uh, injectable solutions, uh, different injectable solutions and are distributed uh, to the country. Uh, another activity of our production uh, complex is uh, on and, um, production of bacterial antigen and anti and, uh, anti sera uh, diagnostic kits, which different uh, diagnostic kits are produced. Uh, another activity is on breeding of the laboratory animals. If you want uh, to uh, get more information about uh, the activities of Pasteur Institute of Iran uh, on the vaccine, you can uh, have a, a review on this uh, paper. And also I will share with you uh, the, uh, the uh, brochure of our uh, vaccines and, and, and diagnostic kits to get more uh, information uh, and uh, data about uh, the production activity of Pasteur Institute of Iran. On uh, conclusion, uh, it can be said that Pasteur Institute of Iran has uh, taken uh, great steps in the prevention and control of infectious diseases. Uh, with its uh, brilliant activities and improved uh, the public health of the society. And uh, this uh, institute is determined to continue to play its important role in providing services for control of infectious diseases. Uh, thank you. And I am uh, with you uh, if there is any question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will open the floor for question and answers. Um, so, do we have any question here from the in-person audience or any comment for Professor Hassan's presentation? So, let me start by saying that I have learned a lot from your presentation in terms of what uh, the huge, uh, huge scale of work that Pressure Institute uh, is doing uh, for its country. I think that is very um, delightful uh, to see that uh, one of the member OIC country has this potential. And I think that is why uh, as ComStech, we always look forward to uh, taking guidance from Pressure Institute. Uh, that's one thing. Um, on uh, Other than that, um, I would request our audience to say a few words about your presentation. Uh, Zainal Abedin, would you like to say a few words? Presentation was including very the potential of potential in OIC. Right. Um, so thank you very much um, for your time, and it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, extremely grateful you. On, on my on behalf of myself as well as from Comstech. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, would uh, you have... Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. I would. I also uh, would like to thank uh, the, for the ComSec and you for uh, letting me to have this presentation and introducing Pastor Institute. Okay.
Thank you very much. <laughs> It seems that there is no more question. Am I right? Uh, yes, I there is no more question. We are oh, okay. the closing of the event. Um, I wish Thank you were here in person so we could have you in the closing ceremony as well. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye, thank you very much. Um, with this, uh, we come to end of our uh, technical session as well as uh, the end of the public lecture for today. Um, on behalf of Comstech and myself, I would like to thank our esteemed speakers uh, from Indonesia and Turkey for their comprehensive and very well put together um, presentations. Uh, I would also like to thank our speaker who, who had joined us from Bashar Institute of Iran for his time and for sharing the kind of work that Bashar Institute is doing. Um, uh, with this, I would request our esteemed um, Senior Director, HR and Administration to please present souvenirs to our guest speakers from Turkey and Indonesia. First, we have uh, Dr. Bel uh, Dr. Yanni uh, for the souvenir, please. Professor Dr. Bella. Uh, with this, I would request uh, our speakers and uh, Senior Director HR Administration to please come forward for the group photo um, here with the participants. You all are requested to please join uh, our speakers for the group photo.